Welcome to this talk with uh, London-based artist Susan Hiller. Um, I have the pleasure to have that conversation with her. And uh, we have half an hour time, so we have to be fairly brief, given the fact that this, this is a richly faceted oeuvre. It will only allow us to have some short glimpses into that work and maybe hopefully also discuss some more general questions of artistic methodology and of the question of how you show art. Uh, some of you may know Susan's work from her major show that she had at the Kunsthalle Basel some years ago. I think it was 2006. 2000. Yeah. And uh, at the moment, there's the preparations for uh, a major exhibition she will have at the Tate in London in February 2011. And there's also uh, a big catalogue in preparation for that exhibition. And uh, maybe there's also some chances to talk about what it means to look back at work, but all m more general terms, at culture. Also, there's something in Art Unlimited. The last silent movie is in Art Unlimited. Sorry? The last, excuse me. It's very loud outside, so I think you have to speak up. I was, I was just going to say, the last silent movie is in Art Unlimited. Of course. <laughs> Susan just reminded me of a very important thing. Just, just around the corner from here, uh, her great piece, Last Silent <coughs> Movie, is currently on display. So please don't miss it. It's worth seeing. It's, it's, it's maybe 16 minutes long, I believe, something like that. 20, I think. And uh, it's worth every second. So please don't miss it. We'll only have a very short glimpse of that in that presentation, but you will have a good chance to see that piece outside afterwards. Susan, uh, let's start um, with a piece that is kind of a first key work, I would say, um, that he did in 1972, Sisters of Menon. Uh, do we have some images? Here we go. Um, it involved, I mean, the major methodology that you uh, em employed for that piece was automatic writing. Mm. And can you tell us a bit how you came about with that concept, with the idea of using this um, idea of automatic writing, which we know from serialists, but also from Jung and others? Well, to make it very brief, it was an accident. I did not intend to make a work with automatic writing. I didn't intend to practice automatic writing. I just simply, it just happened to me one day after I had um, participated in a mail event, a postal art event that I had originated, which in, <clears throat> was an attempt to replicate a telepathy experiment with images that I was very interested in. And so I suppose because the postal event had to do with telepathy and artists transmitting images around the world mentally, I was in a certain frame of mind. That's the only way I can explain it. And I started to write. And the handwriting was nothing like my own handwriting. It's more like that <clears throat> kind of cross between writing and drawing that characterizes uh, so-called automatic writing. And it turned out to be a long text supposedly uh, spoken by or dictated by a group, perhaps, of people called the Sisters of Menon. And then I didn't know what to do with all these pages that had sort of appeared spontaneously. I felt that it wasn't really my work. I didn't feel uh, that I had a, an author's perspective on the work at all. So uh, several, uh, several years later, I decided to make it into a work, and I attempted to contextualize it, and I translated the text and so forth. What's up here is the way I finally installed the pages of automatic writing and the four panels um, at the end of each arm of the cross sort of analyze and contextualize the work. Uh, the realization of that piece took place in the context of conceptual work being mm. done also in Britain at the time, thinking of people like art and language. Yeah. And this is also the context you were yeah. associated with in some way. And still, you were choosing a quite distinctively different path by, um, in, the, in, in, in the sense that in conceptualism, there's 
the idea is, of course, that there is a conscious artistic mm. proposition being made and communicated, yeah. whereas here it seems to be almost the other way around. And yeah. can you say something about the well, reactions you got in well, this regard? Well, uh, yes. <clears throat> I got very, I would say, relatively negative reactions to this work and another work that I think you're going to show because I was... Um, I suppose transgressing the borders of conceptualism and not, that became a very important issue for me to think about. Um, conceptualism, at least the kind, first generation conceptualism in, in, in Britain, also in New York, I, I think, was language based in the sense that Switzerland Football. scored a goal, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Pop Schwitz. Does that mean Switzerland won? Not necessarily, <laughs> but they scored a goal, I think. <laughs> okay, let's continue. Right. How can conceptualism compete? Anyway, so I was transgressing the idea that um, that had been characteristic of the first generation of conceptualists that propositions, self-reflexive propositions dealing with what was already fully conscious that the, the, the claim being, was being made that conceptualism could bring into full consciousness all those areas of art that previously had been unconscious, unarticulated and so forth. So I was just going against that but using the tools, the analytic tools of conceptualism with material that was thought to be irrational and personal. Yeah. You were already alluding to uh, another work that you realized in the ensuing years, which was dedicated to the mm -hmm. unknown artist, the work that you realized between 1972 and 1976, and it involved uh, a collection that you put together of more than 300 postcards from the British coastside with mostly motifs of rough sea. Mm -hmm. and. Um, this work, um, as you see, uh, did have some aspects of conceptual work in approach in mm -hmm. terms of serialization and duplication and also, you could say, uh, rational scrutinization. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously it differed in many ways from the usual subject matters mm -hmm. of conceptual art at the time and also um, in terms of the ironic romantic mm. motifs, mm. thinking about the British humor of, you know, bad weather combined with the romantic vision of a uh, rough sea. Mm. And um, you have, you, you, you opted for a, a strictly serial uh, and grid yeah. pattern. Yeah. You yeah. could have just as well taken some of these motifs and blown them up and yeah. wh why did you choose not to do that? Well, at, <coughs> at that at that time, I still mentally situated myself within this kind of conceptual rigor. And you're right to say there was an irony in, in the way I was working with this material because I was using an approach, a kind of analysis that comes out of uh, linguistic analysis, actually. And it's really inappropriate to use that with visual material. Um, of course, that wasn't what people picked up on. They didn't understand the irony. They, 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 un, they thought that I was sort of trying to marry pop art and, uh, and conceptualism. I remember you, you told me at once that at a conversation, I think at the ICA, mm -hmm. uh, a fellow artist uh, kind of furiously accused <laughs> you of having sold out to pop art, yes, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Because I don't know if you can, any of you can remember this, because I know conceptualism, the whole world looks different when you're looking back on it. But there was a sort of, a, a kind of rigorousness, which in many cases averged on Puritanism, in the sense that nothing with color, nothing with images, nothing with an art historical uh, kind of appeal, a visual appeal was supposed to be eliminated. And as you can see, these images are very, very seductive. They represent a kind of miniature domestic sublime. I mean, you can have the sublime on a postcard, if you like. 
And all of this was just really considered dangerous territory. But who, who were the, the unknown artists you dedicated the piece to? Well, the unknown artists are the people, the two kinds of people, at least. They're the photographers who took the images of the rough sea, and that, that's, those images, the seduction of the images has a lot to do with photography, because the images freeze something that we only see in motion. And there's something very uh, attractive about seeing a wave fixed in a form that you would never see it in with your naked eye. But they're the photographers, and then there are the I would say semi-slave laborers who tint the postcards and they're very low paid uh, factory techniques of tinting these postcards which are then re-photographed to emerge in the form that we see them in. And th those were the workers that I was, felt particularly close to because they were all women and what I discovered was that in this very hackneyed work that they did day after day after day, there was, they allowed space for a great deal of creativity. That is, they did not take, tint any postcard the same way twice. And they would have an image, they might have a hundred of the same image, and they, each one that they produced would be different. And that interested me very much. So that was the idea of dedicating it to the unknown artists. Then there was a third group of artists involved, the artists who were actually painters, landscape painters, who were commissioned to paint pictures of the rough sea. And the work that they produce is very, very hackneyed. They make all the different seaside towns look the same. So there was a contrast between the supposed artists who were doing the pa real painting, producing hackneyed images, and the people doing what we would call hack work in England, doing the creative stuff. No. I mean, that's a motif, I think, that or an actual objective of your work uh, that returns again and again, which is the idea of exposing the actual collective labor that went into producing the yeah. work, instead of trying to mystify or hide that, mm -hmm. as is often the case with the fetish art object. Yeah. But even also in conceptual art, where often it's about a single, sometimes even genius artist, conceptual proposition. Yeah. Well, I'm. You know, all those things were very much discussed in the 70s, and I was very involved in all those discussions. And it always struck me as sort of strange that somebody would do a film of, uh, I'd say, himself in those days, usually himself doing something really interesting. And the film would never say who'd done the filming. But clearly someone was following this artist around while he did his performance to do the filming, but the filmmaker was never mentioned. It was usually a girlfriend. And, uh, you know, all this, <laughs> it seems ridiculous now, although that's, that particular thing still continues, that people don't acknowledge who did the filming or who did the photography. Yeah, that was politics, you know. I think, in fact, your husband was involved in realizing this piece to some yes, extent. Yes, yes, he certainly was. Um, um, well, I think it was, it's one of the major achievements, I think, in terms of addressing the question of the aftermath of the Holocaust in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, and this piece involves you visiting every single street in Germany um, that, has, that is the sign of a former Jewish presence. So these are sh street names like Jüdische Straße or Judenstraße or Judenweg, and you documented virtually all of them, as far as I know. And um, this work took several forms, one of which was a display of these images, accompanied by uh, a tabularium of all the different locations in Germany. And there was also uh, a film that is a kind of meditation of static shots from some of these yeah. places. Um, which integrally works also with a musical soundtrack and with certain sound elements to give an impression of what these places actually are today and how the communities where they are located actually deal with them. Yeah. Um, can you talk a bit about how you, how you came to that? 
project and also what your impression is how it has been received in Germany? Um, okay, uh, but this is it's hard to be really quick about this, but I'll just say yeah. that again, it was, it was an accident. Uh, I was invited to Berlin on a DAAD fellowship and I was wandering around uh, Mitte with a map as one does, looking up at you know, the street signs to see where I was going and I found myself on a street called Judenstrasse and I was immensely shocked and uh, taken aback and confused and bewildered and etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, because after all this was Germany and uh, there was the Jews were exterminated more or less and the street is still there and it still has this name but then it occurred to me that this was a kind of unofficial commemoration you know to keep the street name uh, anyway there were contradictions so I then discovered there were other streets in Germany with this kind of name, this signifier. And nobody had ever made a list, nobody had done the research. I, I got involved with looking at every single map of Germany to find these streets. I mean, people say to me, oh, you did the research. Yes, it was the most basic kind of research. I looked at maps, you know. And I found 303 streets, and then I realized I couldn't pick some of them because it would be making an aesthetic judgment, this one looks more interesting, this is whatever, as I had to do all of them. And then, then it became a kind of meditation on a word, a, a word that signifies that which is not there anymore, so. It's then. a weird mixture that there's a word that actually, in some way, um, rightly locates a certain presence that has been, like you say, I mean, people have been persecuted and, uh, and uh, dis uh, destroyed. And at the same time, it's already a stigma. You know, I mean, that's also, I mean, the way you title that work, J Street, also has yeah. these resonances thinking of the J that was stamped into no, passports. Uh, passports, that's right. You've written very well about this piece, and I know we can't really go into it, but I'm... You know, I think I've said before, I wanted to take a very cool approach, you know, to the subject. I, I really, I'm not sure it's a piece about the Holocaust. I think it's a piece about absence and memory. And when I was working on it, there were enough other attempted Holocausts going on in other parts of the world for me to realize that this idea of places and peoples is an issue that, you know, we need to think about. And these, these signs mark something which is not there now, but yet the sign remains, which is very interesting. And I think you said uh, in your essay that the signs are disturbing, but to take them away would be more disturbing. Yeah. So it's an exactly. interesting yeah. um, problem. And since there are no pictures of Jews or Nazis or anything but street signs, sometimes on ordinary suburban streets, it's really up to the viewer to construct the meaning and to, to, to bring to it what he or she wants to think about. The work that we've already <laughs> mentioned in the beginning, the last silent movie, which is on display here at Art Unlimited, is a work that in some way deals also with the question of neglect mm. and memory, which is the question of distinguished languages. Mm. And uh, you made a quite thorough research of languages, and especially of, la of, of audio sources of languages. Um, I can't play this now here because it would just be too complicated, but please look at the piece next door. It's on display permanently here. Um, we hear these voices of, uh, of let's say, uh, there's a man singing a song in a uh, language from East Timor about a cricket and a ball of mud that <laughs> almost has a kind of Dadaist humor to it. And it's really hard, I mean, I must say it's heartbreaking to hear mm. this and think this language is dead. It doesn't, it, nobody speaks mm. it anymore. Um, can you speak a bit about the, the question of how art and science in that particular question, like of approaching this question, seem to collide? Uh, yeah. Um, I think that the way an artist approaches 
subject like that, or to use the word research, is a little bit misleading. And this is such a hot topic now. I just want to say something about it. Artist research disturbs the kind of research that scientists do. No scientist, no anthropologist or ethnologist would have put together a collection of languages in the way that I did, because I wasn't concentrating on the kinds of things they concentrate on. I became aware that there are enormous anxiety about the loss of languages, more anxiety perhaps than there is about why people lose their languages. I mean, there are very good political, social, economic causes for that. And that the languages are collected by linguists and they go into academic archives and then no one else is ever allowed to hear them for some reason. So they die a second death, which I found, again, complicated and ironic. So I wanted to establish an intimacy. So again, this is piece is about feeling, and it's, a, it's about the letting viewers have their feelings about it. Um, when you listen to when you listen to sound, the in, there's an intimacy because the sound waves actually touch your ear. It's physical. It's not like looking. Looking is at a distance, right? Hearing, hearing is a physical sensation. Your body is responding to another body. That's that's what that piece is based on, the fact that it's audio. So I don't know what else I can say about it, really. Yeah. Um, I'm switching now to a seemingly completely different work. But I think, again, this is about a question of mem memory and about dealing with something where, from an art perspective, we usually think this is no-go area, which is, in this case, sacred waters from <laughs> uh, religious pilgrim places mm -hmm. uh, that you collected in Victorian wheels mm -hmm. and placed them in uh, in these display boxes or uh, vitrines, yeah. and um, all of this in homage yeah. per title to Joseph Beuys. And what I find really interesting is how, in, in an, I feel slightly ironic way, you, you deal with the question of the, the, the problem that many people also have with Beuys, the idea that there is a kind of shamanist, mm. religious, um, credibility mm -hmm. assigned to the artist and the fetishes they produce. Yeah, yeah. Could you um, say something? Oh, God. Okay, a complicated thing here. This yeah. is about belief and disbelief. Yeah. Okay. Now, I actually did go to these places and I did collect the water, and it does interest me very much to do that. And as with the J Street project, we're visiting each of those Jewish streets became for me a kind of pilgrimage. Jorg pointed out that it's basically a pilgrimage in quest of creating a work of my own, so that takes away some of the aura that it has for me. That's personal. But when you look at a cabinet like this, which is full of, I think there are 63 different places that I've been to, um, and they're labeled with, you know, um, Lourdes or St. Helen or whatever, including some ancient Greek and Roman places, I think it puts you in a certain kind of position of, of both doubt and belief, because again, it's very seductive. I always say that I'm dealing with cultural artifacts. Belief in these kind of relics is a cultural artifact, but we need to feel it and look at it, or else we don't realize how complicated it is. That's the kind of issue Boyce was playing with, I think. Belief, disbelief, you know. I think his practice has been oversimplified. This work is one of a number of homages that I've been working on recently in relationship to famous... Famous, almost, famous almost. football players. <laughs> oh, God. Famous artists who are a generation or two older than me and whose presence was a big influence on the kind of thinking that was taking place when I was starting off as an artist. In recent years, you've started a, a series of works that pay homage to artists you admire, but you also, in some way, I think, which I found is really interesting about this, 
give them a present <laughs> with your homage that is also taking back something from them and giving it to the people, to put it a bit uh, naive. Yeah. Yeah. And in this case, these are the people who uh, you could say, uh, yeah, redo Eve Klein's famous Leap into the mm. Void in, in different forms, as you see here. This is just a small mm -hmm. segment out of many images that you collected from the internet. And um, would you agree that the, the emphasis of these works even when at first hand they seem to be one singular or about the uh, homage to one singular artist are ultimately even more maybe about all these people who have um, disseminated their ideas into a uh, popular culture. Right. Well, that you see, this is again goes back a long time to my idea that art for me would always start with a cultural artifact that is a product of our society and it would investigate that artifact. Now, Eve Klein's Leap into the Void is a, a product of our society as much as it might be considered a singular work of artistic genius. I mean, the two things go hand in hand. I tend not to go with the idea of artistic genius, so it interested me to discover many, many people doing this kind of thing, uh, quite often anonymously, and again, with a certain irony, they don't intend to deceive us, as Klein did, into thinking that he was really levitating, but they want to present themselves as being capable of this kind of aspirational act. And I find that very moving, and it gives a different perspective on Klein. I don't think I'm taking anything away from Klein. I'm merely showing that he's part of the social. Yeah. Be talking about being part of the social, you're very much invited for a couple of questions. There's only very few minutes left, so please take the opportunity now. Don't hesitate. There's no time for hesitation now. You know, any minute Switzerland might score a goal and then it's over. So please ask your question now. No. I don't think there's going to be okay, any question. Okay, short moment. We can go then. Well, quickly, one question for me. Again, um, as, as I mentioned, there is a, retrospe well, a retrospective in the making, but I, I know from years and years that in, in, a, in a more general terms, for example, you would prefer the term retrospection. Yes. Uh, the idea that there's ways of looking at things that are not necessarily the ones that kind of freeze frame the work as a kind of succession mm -hmm. of achievements. Um, did you, what's your response to, I mean, in recent years, artists, uh, so-called relational aesthetics, connected artists have tackled the very idea of what a retrospective or even an exhibition would mm. be. Do you see connections there to your own approach or possibilities and potentials? I think there was a question. Well, <clears throat> I think that I'm living my life backward in a sense because I did all those sorts of things in the 70s and now I'm trying to do a real retrospective, which is very difficult. <laughs> get it? Oh, God. <laughs> I guess. Wow. Please continue. Nothing is ever the same when you do it again. And nothing is, nothing is as it is in memory. So this is a dilemma. It's a philosophical problem. I've written quite critically about major retrospectives put together by institutions of works by other artists. I think once the artwork enters the institution in that format, probably a lot of its meaning has already been uh, almost unconsciously censored out. But that's inevitable. I don't, see, I don't see that the kind of ironic anti-retrospectives that artists have been doing recently are, are no less, uh, you know, I think they are just as institutionally bound as anything. Can we go now? <laughs> so I can't compete against this. I no think questions. we've run out of time now. And I thank you very much for your interest. And uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Thanks. Susan Hiller. Thank you. Your Kaiser. <laughs>